Chapter 8. The Ideal. Temple Marriage. And a Sturdy Home. Advice Full of Wisdom. The following segments were authored by George Q. Cannon and taken from the juvenile instructor, as referenced. Marriage should be encouraged. But parents and others who have influence with the young should be careful to have marriages congenial. No true happiness can result from an ill-assorted marriage. Above all things, care should be taken to impress upon our young people the necessity of marrying those of their own faith. The experience of the past 40 years since we have lived in these mountains has given hundreds of illustrations of the unhappy results which follow the marriage of people of our faith with those who are not of our faith. If a Mormon girl who married a man not of her faith has remained true to her religion and her early training and convictions, she has not had a happy life, and too frequently misery has been the result. It is true, there have been a few instances out of the hundreds of cases of this kind where the man has become convinced of the truth of the gospel and has espoused it, but these instances are so rare as to be very remarkable. In the great majority of cases, girls who have thus married have gradually lost their faith and become aliens to their former associates and to the religion of the Lord. The experience of these many years ought to be a lesson that should not be lost right bracket sight of. Therefore, we say that such unions are not happy ones. The marriage of an ignorant person with an intelligent one is not always attended with happy results. There should be some similarity of taste, of disposition, of training, and certainly of belief, to make a couple congenial. A young man, therefore, in seeking for a partner and the same may be said of young women, should bear in mind that to live happily through life in the wedded condition, they should have partners of congenial tastes and of similar training. An intelligent, educated girl who marries an ignorant man must either lift him to her level, if she would lead a pleasant life and maintain her self-respect, or she must descend to his level. It is seldom that a woman can lift her husband in this way, she is more likely either to become discouraged and alienated from him, and separated from him, or descend to his level. If she does the latter, she cannot escape the feeling that she is lowering herself and descending from the station she might have occupied. The young man who marries a girl who is not his equal in education or in intelligence, is more likely to lift her up to his level, and to inspire her with noble thought, and to develop her high attributes, than in the other case. There is less danger from such a marriage than in the case of the woman who marries one inferior to herself. Too great care cannot be taken in forming associations. It is an old and a true saying that people are known by the company they keep. No young man can associate with those who are not pure without being, to some extent, injured by the contact. A virtuous girl or woman should shun the society of the unvirtuous, for if they become familiar with vice, they lose their horror of it. Pope has stated it beautifully when he says, Right bracket vice is a monster of so frightful mean. As, to be hated, needs but to be seen. Yet seen too oft, familiar with her face. We first endure, then pity, then embrace. Those who associate with people who are unvirtuous are themselves in danger. They place themselves in a position where they are liable to be overcome. Familiarity, as the poet says, produces this result. The young man who keeps the company of the profane soon learns to look upon profanity as a trivial thing, he ceases to be shocked at it, and is very liable to fall into the habit himself. So if a young man associates with those who drink liquor and become intoxicated, his familiarity with them and with their habits causes any feeling of repulsion that he might have had to wear away, and he ceases to look upon it as a grave offense. If he continues to associate with them, he is liable to become a drunkard himself. The same is true of gambling and every other vice. No one can associate with those who practice vice without exposing himself or herself to its contamination. The juvenile instructor, Vol. 26 315. Marriage among the Latter day Saints. The purity of a people can be measured somewhat correctly by the sacredness with which the marriage tie is held in their midst. Among no people should a high value be placed on this ordinance than among the Latter day Saints, for there are no people who view marriage as a permanent condition here and hereafter as we do. There are no religious people of whom we have any knowledge who believe as the Latter-day Saints do, that the relationships entered into here between the sexes under proper conditions endure beyond this life. In fact the idea of a family organization existing in the next world is thoroughly Mormon, and has come to us through the revelations which the Lord has given to his people in these latter times. 
to a latter-day saint the knowledge that all those ten dash da relations which exist in this life, and which are so productive of happiness here, will exist in the eternal world, constitutes one of the chief anticipations connected with heaven, in fact, no latter-day saint can conceive of a heaven where all these ties would be dissolved, and where the sexes would dwell apart and have none of these associates that endear them to each other in this life. It is a most delightful thing to contemplate that the union of husband and wife has been made possible for eternity by the restoration of ordinances and authority to administer them, and that not only will man and wife dwell together as such throughout eternity, but that their children also will bear the relationship to them of children in the great future. A belief in such a condition of affairs robs death of many of its chief terrors. The husband who lays his wife in the tomb knows that the separation is but temporary. So with the wife who is called to part with her husband, and parents with their children, and children with their parents. They know that they will be reunited and dwell together as husband and wife, as parents and children, throughout eternity. The teachings of the Bible and the other revelations of the Lord possess a significance in the light of this doctrine that can be understood. These divine teachings speak of the time when the faithful shall wear crowns and sit upon thrones, that is, they shall possess kingly and queenly dignity. A crown would be but an empty bauble if its wearer had no power. To sit upon a throne without dominion would be unmeaning, and would bring no gratification. But when the saints are told that they shall sit upon thrones, and that they shall wear crowns, they are symbols of power and dominion, and of the rule which they will exercise. And over whom will they rule? And what will be the nature of their dominion? The answer is found in the teaching which the Lord has given concerning the right bracket family organization. A man will stand at the head of his family. He will preside or reign over his own household. His children will be obedient to him. They will constitute his kingdom. With an ever-growing posterity there will be increasing dominion, and in reigning over them as a ruler, it is quite proper that a crown should be worn. These being the views and expectations of the latter-day saints, they should of all people, be the most careful in forming marriage relations. Parents cannot be too diligent in teaching their children correct ideas upon this subject. Boys should be taught to be very discreet in the selection of a girl for a wife, and girls should be deeply impressed with the great importance of accepting only as a lover and a husband, one in whom she has entire confidence, that he will be true and faithful in all the relations of life in this state of existence, and be a suitable companion for her throughout eternity. Juvenile Instructor. Marry those of your own faith. There has been displeasure expressed very frequently because the latter-day saints have advanced the view that it is unwise for members of the church to form marriages with those of a different faith. It has been urged against us by our opponents as a cause of offence, and as though we were doing something that was contrary to the practices of other people. We have been frequently at act in entertaining and expressing this view as if we stood alone, but the facts are that there is no denomination of Christians that does not entertain similar views to a greater or less extent. No faithful Methodist would think it proper for a member of his church to marry a man or woman who did not believe in that faith. The same may be said of Presbyterians, of Episcopalians, of Baptists, and of the sects generally. The Catholics, however, probably ex-press themselves more strongly upon this subject than any other denomination. In a recent article published in the Catholic Review this subject is taken up. The mixed marriage, the writer says, is dangerous to the faith of the Catholic party, and almost fatal to the faith of the children. The article further says, the virtuous and consistent Catholic is, therefore, bound in conscience to avoid marriage with a Protestant, the priest is bound in conscience to prevent these marriages, as far as he can. The fact that they are doing immense harm to our people, the review says, is well known to every priest in the country, and every pastor has a right to warn his people against them, and to take measures to prevent them. The whole article is very emphatic upon this question. Following up the statements which we have quoted, it says, There is no necessity for mixed marriages in our country, where Catholics are very numerous. The Constitution and the American flag do not suffer by the action of the priest in seeking to prevent them. If the ordinary Catholic finds his faith more burdensome than pleasant, no one can restrain him from laying it aside. The worst feature of the case is that the Catholic party to mixed marriage remains in the church and trains the family of very poor Catholics to scandalize the faithful by pagan morality under a Catholic mask. Outside of Christianity there is no morality worthy of the name. The mixed marriage of the present day in America is usually the marriage of the Catholic with the pagan. Two earnestly religious people of Protestant and Catholic beliefs rarely unite in marriage. 
if they do, the domestic right bracket discord is intensified. The non-Catholic party to a mixed marriage, if a man, is usually indifferent to any religion, and his morality is one of convenience. His children have nothing to learn from him, and his wife finds him a dead weight when he should be her main prop. All experience has shown that these children fail to persevere in the faith. Their sympathies seem never to be fully roused to its importance. They are a weakness and a hindrance, their morality is of low standard, they become minimizers easily and fall away. We do not think any Catholic has a right to expose his children to the inevitable dangers of a mixed marriage. It is inconceivable that any Catholic with the ordinary graces of baptism and training can so debase the office of parent. We have always thought the Catholic party to mixed marriage mentally and spiritually weak. Experience has proved to us in this country that this view of the case as presented in this Catholic paper applies with peculiar force to mixed marriages which have taken place in Utah. The evils which are described as following the marriages of Protestants and Catholic have been witnessed as following mixed marriages in our community. Many girls have supposed that the husband's love for them would be the means of bringing them into the church, but the experience of our many years' residence in these valleys has proved the fallacy of that hope. There have been exceptions, it is true, but they are very rare. The most frequent result has been that the girls have lost their faith and succumbed to the influence of the husband, and they and their children are aliens to the covenant. There should be in all marriages common sympathies. Similarity of tastes and of sympathies, and especially of faith, is very important in wedlock. Where this is absent marriage is right bracket apt to be unhappy and a failure. For a marriage to be a truly happy one among us, a young man or a young woman in seeking a partner should make it a matter of the first consideration to find one who is strong in the faith which he or she possesses. This forms the principal foundation for future concord and happiness. Following this, care should be taken upon the point of good habits, good temper, industry and agreeable tastes. A man that is not of the right character before marriage ought not to be trusted to reform after marriage. It is seldom that such changes occur. The girl deceives herself who trusts to have such a result follow her marriage with a man of this kind. Her love for him should not blind her to his defects, in fact, if she would take the right course, she would never allow herself to become entangled in such a way as to place her affections upon an unworthy person. The society of such should be shunned, and if care be taken in this direction, there is but little danger of improper attachments springing up. Marriage is the most important step in a young woman's life. It should be entered upon with the greatest care. Both sexes should earnestly seek the guidance of heaven in a matter so momentous as the forming of a contract as husband and wife. It ought not to be formed for a day, or for a few years, but with a view to being continued as long as life shall last, and then throughout eternity. One of the great sins of the present age is the frequency with which divorces occur. The proportion which divorces bear to marriages in some of the states and cities is enormous and appalling. Such a number of divorces is an evidence of a very low state of morals. It exhibits in startling manner how little sanctity is attached to this sacred relation. Where divorces prevail to such an extent, marriage almost sinks into adultery. Right bracket this holy relationship is dragged down from its high position and degraded almost to the level of lust. Such evils are exceedingly offensive in the sight of God. If they should prevail among us, they would without doubt bring down upon us the displeasure of our Heavenly Father. Divorces should only be sought for when absolutely necessary to effect temporal and eternal salvation. For all these reasons, therefore, the greatest care should be taken by our young people in forming alliances. They should be formed judiciously. The guidance of the Spirit should be sought for. The will of the Lord concerning the match should be obtained. The Juvenile Instructor, November 1, 1891 the Goal of an Ideal Temple Marriage. By Parley P. Pratt. In Philadelphia I had the happiness of once more meeting with President Smith, and of spending several days with him and others, and with the saints in that city and vicinity. During these interviews he taught me many great and glorious principles concerning God and the heavenly order of eternity. It was at this time that I received from him the first idea of eternal family organization and the eternal union of the sexes in those inexpressibly enduring relationships which none but the highly intellectual, the refined and pure in heart know how to prize and which are at the very foundation of everything worthy to be called happiness. Till then I had learned to esteem kindred affections and sympathies as appertaining solely to this transitory state as something from which the heart must be entirely weaned in order to be fitted for its heavenly state. 
it was Joseph Smith who taught me how to prize the enduring relationships of father and mother, husband and wife, of brother and sister, son and daughter. It was from him that I learned that the wife of my bosom might be secured to right bracket me for time and all eternity, and that the refined sympathies and affections which endeared us to each other emanated from the fountain of divine eternal love. It was from him that I learned that we might cultivate these affections and grow and increase in the same to all eternity, while the result of our endless union would be an offspring as numerous as the stars of heaven or the sands of the seashore. It was from him that I learned the true dignity and destiny of a son of God, clothed with an eternal priesthood, as the patriarch and sovereign of his countless offspring. It was from him that I learned that the highest dignity of womanhood was to stand as a queen and priestess to her husband, and to reign forever and ever as the queen mother of her numerous and still increasing offspring. I had loved before, but I knew not why. But now I loved with a pureness and intensity of elevated, exalted feeling, which would lift my soul from the transitory things of this groveling sphere, and expand it as the ocean. I felt that God was my heavenly Father indeed, that Jesus was my brother, and that the wife of my bosom was an immortal, eternal companion, a kind ministering angel, given to me as a comfort, and a crown of glory forever and ever. In short, I could now love with the spirit and with the understanding also. Yet, at that time, my dearly beloved brother, Joseph Smith, had barely touched a single key, had merely lifted a corner of the veil, and given me a single glance into eternity. Autobiography of Parley P. Pratt, P. 329-330. WHO will not inherit celestial glory. By Parley P. Pratt. I now wish to say a few words on the subject of matrimony, and also on the subject of raising and educating children. Right bracket who that has had one glimpse of the order of the celestial family, and of the eternal connections and relationships which should be formed here in order to be enjoyed there, who that has felt one thrill of the energy and power of eternal life and love which flows from the divine spirit of revelation, can ever be contented with the corrupt pleasures of a moment which arise from the unlawful connections and desires, or what saint has any degree of faith in the power of the resurrection and of eternal life can be contented to throw himself away by matrimonial connections with sectarians or other worldlings who are so blind that they can never secure an eternal union by the authority of the holy priesthood which has power to bind that which should be bound in heaven. By such a union, or by corrupt, unlawful and unvirtuous connections and indulgences, they not only lose their own celestial crown and throne, but also plunge their children into ruin and darkness, which will probably cause them to neglect so great a salvation for the sake of the love and the praise of the world and the traditions of men. Oh, my friends, my brethren and sisters, and especially the younger class of our community, I beseech you in the fear and love of God and entreat you in view of eternal glory and exaltation in his kingdom, to deny yourselves all the corrupt and abominable practices and desires of the world and the flesh, and seek to be pure and virtuous in all your ways and thoughts, and not only so, but make no matrimonial connections or engagements till you have asked counsel of the Spirit of God in humble prayer before him, till you know and understand the principles of eternal life and union sufficiently to act wisely and prudently, and in that way that will eventually secure yourself and your companion and your children in the great family circle of the celestial organization. Right bracket I would now say to parents that their own salvation, as well as that of their children, depends to a certain extent on the bringing up of their children, and educating them in the truth, that their traditions and early impressions may be correct. No parents who continue to neglect this after they themselves have come to the knowledge of the truth, can be saved in the celestial kingdom. From the Prophet published in New York City, 1845. Blessings of an Ideal Temple Marriage. Why marry in the temple? by John A. Widso. Marriage, the most important event between birth and death, is a determining condition of life's happiness. Therefore, it should be entered into with the greatest of care. A companion for life should be one who lives righteously, to whom abundant love may be given, and who can be respected in his or her daily walk and talk. Likewise, the marriage covenant should be of such a nature as to help create, build, and maintain daily happiness. As the successive days are, so all of life will be. Wealth, power, and fame are beggared in comparison with the joy that comes from a happy family life. The church offers the privilege of marriage in the temple, as the foremost means of establishing and maintaining happiness in the households of its members. It is a privilege beyond compare, which every prospective bride and groom should seek and use. The conditions are such that every person may fit himself to receive this privilege, so earnestly coveted by true Latter-day Saints. Here are nine brief answers to the question. Why marry in the temple? 
right bracket 1. It is the Lord's desire and will. The temple is by divine decree the place where marriages should, if possible, be performed. Marriage is of such crucial importance in life that it should begin with full obedience to God's law. Love is the foundation of marriage, but love itself is a product of law and lives by law. True love is law-abiding, for the highest satisfactions come to a law-abiding life. Moreover, true love of man for woman always includes love of God from whom all good things issue. The proof of our love of God is obedience to his law. Besides, life is so full of problems that the married couple should from the first seek the constant favor of the Lord. A sense of security and comfort comes to all who are wedded within the temple. They have obeyed the law. They have pleased the Lord. As law-abiding citizens in the kingdom of God, they have special claim upon divine aid, blessings, and protection. Conformity to the practices of the church always builds happiness in life. Marriage should begin right by obedience to law. 2. It is in harmony with the sacred nature of the marriage covenant. Temple marriages are also more in harmony with the nature and importance of the occasion. They are performed in an attractive ceiling room, especially dedicated for the purpose. The ceremony itself is simple, beautiful, and profound. Relatively few witnesses are present. Quiet and order prevail. There are no external trappings to confuse the mind. Full attention may be given to the sacred covenants to be made, and the blessings to follow, covering the vast period of eternal existence. The attention is focused upon the meaning of the marriage ceremony, and not upon distracting outside features which characterize a wedding in an elaborate social setting. Such concentration of the soul upon the covenants entered into and the blessings promised, becomes a joyful happy memory, incomparably sweeter than that of the right bracket usual rush and show of a wedding outside temple walls. Lovely in its simple beauty and deep import is a temple wedding. There is ample opportunity after the ceremony in the temple for a reception, simple or elaborate, at which friends may gather to congratulate the couple, and to wish them happiness. 3. It tends to ensure marital happiness. Experience has shown that temple marriages are generally the happiest. There are relatively fewer divorces among couples who have been sealed over the altars of the temple. This is shown by dependable statistics. Today's views of marriage are notably loose, yet no person with a decent outlook on life will enter the marriage state as an experiment. Divorce does not return the individuals to their former condition. Scars remain. Hasty weddings and the easy divorces that follow menace individual and public welfare. When the integrity of the family, the unit of society, vanishes, and family relationships are held in disrespect, society is headed for disaster. The deliberation that precedes a temple marriage, the solemnity that accompanies it, and the power that seals and blesses it, form a bulwark against many evils of the day. The temple marriage hedges about, and keeps inviolate, the happiness that of right belongs to the married state. 4. It permits the association of husband and wife for time and for all eternity. The essential difference between temple and all other marriages is of the greatest consequence. In the temple, and only there, the bridal couple are wedded for time and eternity. The contract is endless. Here and hereafter, on earth and beyond, they may travel together in loving companionship. This precious gift conforms to the Latter-day Saint belief that existence in the life after this may be active, useful, progressive. Love, content to end with death, is perishable, poor and helpless. Marriage that lasts right bracket only during earth life is a sad one, for the love established between man and woman, as they live together and rear their family, should not die, but live, and grow richer with the eternal years. True love hopes and prays for an endless continuation of association with the loved one. To those who are sealed to each other for all existence, love is ever warm, more hopeful, believing, courageous, and fearless. Such people live the richer, more joyful life. To them happiness and the making of it have no end. Dismal, dreary, full of fear, is the outlook upon love that ends with death. The youth of the church dare not forego the gift of everlasting marriage. 5. It provides the eternal possession of children and family relationship. There is yet an added blessing. Children born under the temple covenant belong to their parents for all time and eternity. That is, the family relationships on earth are continued, forever, here and hereafter. The family, continued from earth into the next world, becomes a unit in everlasting life. In the long eternities we shall not be lonely wanderers, but side by side with the loved ones who have gone before and those who shall follow, we shall travel the endless journey. What mother does not value this promise? What father does not feel his heart warm towards the eternal possession of his family?
what heartbreakings might have been avoided if humanity had been true to the truth and had surrendered to the sealing power of the priesthood of God. Temple marriage becomes a promise of unending joy. 6. It acts as a restraint against evil. The powers of darkness are ever active to push mankind into evil paths. Often, we are tempted to do foolish things. In the family little things may lead to discord. To create unhappiness is the aim of the adversary of righteousness. Here appears one of the foremost blessings of the temple marriage. Those who have been sealed in the temple have their eyes fixed upon eternity. Right bracket they dare not forfeit the promised blessings. The family is to them an everlasting possession. They remember the covenants which make possible this eternal association. The temple marriage, with all that it means, becomes a restraining force in the presence of temptation. All family acts are more likely to be shaped in anticipation of an undying relationship. Under the influence of the memory of the temple ceremony, family differences are swallowed up in peace, hate is transmuted into love, fear into courage, and evil is rebuked and cast out. Peace is the world's great need. From the temples of the Lord, and from everything done within them, issues the spirit of truth which is the foundation of peace. 7. It furnishes the opportunity for endless progression. Modern revelation sets forth the high destiny of those who are sealed for everlasting companionship. They will be given opportunity for a greater use of their powers. That means progress. They will attain more readily their place in the presence of the Lord, they will increase more rapidly in every power, they will approach more nearly to the likeness of God, they will more completely realize their divine destiny. And this progress is not delayed until life after death. It begins here, today, for those who yield obedience to the law. Life is tasteless without progress. Eternal marriage, with all that it means, provides for unending advancement. Eternal increase is the gift to all who enter into the eternal marriage covenant, as made in the temples of the Lord. 8. It places the family under the protection of the power of the priesthood. They who have won a temple marriage, have been sealed for time and eternity, by the power of the holy priesthood. This is the supreme power committed to man's keeping. That power issues from the unseen world. It gives life and light to the world. Human life with its cares and worries, is transfigured into a radiant spirit ash ends and adventure, when it clings to this divine power and is blessed by it. To walk under divine authority, to possess it, to be a part of it, is to walk with heads erect, with grateful hearts, before our fellow men and our Father in heaven. The men and women who have come with this power out of the Lordo's holy house, will be hedged about by divine protection, and walk more safely among the perplexities of earth. They will be indeed the ultimate conquerors of earth, for they come with the infinite power of God to solve the problems of earth. Spiritual power accompanies all who marry in the temple, if they thenceforth keep their sacred covenants. 9. It provides a God-like destiny for human beings. If a man marry a wife by my word, which is my law, and it is sealed unto them by the Holy Spirit of promise, by him who is anointed, unto whom I have appointed this power and the keys of this priesthood, and it shall be said unto them, Ye shall come forth in the first resurrection, and if it be after the first resurrection, in the next resurrection, and shall inherit thrones, kingdoms, principalities, and powers, dominions, all heights and depths. Asterisk, asterisk, asterisk. Then shall they be gods, because they have no end, therefore they shall be from everlasting to everlasting because they continue, then shall they be above all, because all things are subject unto them. Then shall they be gods, because they have all power, and the angels are subject unto them. Evidences and Reconciliations, p. 231-236. The Ideal Home. By Press. Joseph F. Smith. Right bracket a home is not a home in the eye of the gospel, unless there dwell perfect confidence and love between the husband and the wife. Home is a place of order, love, union, rest, confidence, and absolute trust, where the breath of suspicion of infidelity cannot enter, where the woman and the man each have implicit confidence in each other's honor and virtue. What then is an ideal home model home, such as it should be the ambition of the latter-day saints to build, such as a young man starting out in life, should wish to erect for himself? and the answer came to me. It is one in which all worldly considerations are secondary. One in which the father is devoted to the family with which God has blessed him, counting them of first importance, and in which they in turn permit him to live in their hearts. One in which there is confidence, union, love, sacred devotion between father and mother and children and parents. One in which the mother takes every pleasure in her children, supported by the father all being moral, pure, God-fearing. As the tree is judged by its fruit, so also do we judge the home by the children. 
in the ideal home true parents rear loving thoughtful children, loyal to the death, to father and mother and home. In it there is the religious spirit, for both parents and children have faith in God, and their practices are in conformity with that faith, the members are free from the vices and contaminations of the world, are pure in morals, having upright hearts beyond bribes and temptations, ranging high in the exalted standards of manhood and womanhood. Peace, order, and contentment reign in the hearts of the inmates let them be rich or poor, in things material. There are not vain regrets, no expressions of discontent against father, from the boys and girls, in which they complain. If we only had this or that, or were like this family or that, or could do like so and so. Complaints that have caused fathers many uncertain steps, demise, restless nights, and untold anxiety. In their place is the loving thoughtfulness to mother right bracket and father, by which the boys and girls work with a will and a determination to carry some of the burden that the parents have staggered under these many years. There is the kiss for mother, the caress for father, the thought that they have sacrificed their own hopes and ambitions, their strength, even life itself to their children, there is gratitude in payment for all that has been given them. In the ideal home the soul is not starved, neither are the growth and expansion of the finer sentiments paralyzed for the coarse and sensual pleasures. The main aim is not to heap up material wealth, which generally draws further and further from the true, the ideal, the spiritual life, but it is rather to create soul wealth, consciousness of noble achievement, an outflow of love and helpfulness. It is not costly painting, tapestries, priceless bric a brac, various ornaments, costly furniture, fields, herds, houses, and lands which constitute the ideal home, nor yet the social enjoyments and ease so tenaciously sought by many, but it is rather beauty of soul, cultivated, loving, faithful, true spirits, hands that help, and hearts that sympathize, love that seeks not its own. Thoughts and acts that touch our life to finer issues, these lie at the foundation of the ideal home. Improvement Era, 8 385 to 388, Gospel Doctrine, p 301 to 304.